Okay. Good afternoon. This is Stephanie Wilson Coleman with the Sip of Inspiration. And joining me for tonight's episode is Eric Twiggs. He has an incredibly exciting subject. And I was when I ran across him, I was wondering, how in the world did you get into that? Because he actually teaches us to overcome one of the number one issues that we have when it comes to meeting our goals. Eric has a podcast also and a book too. So I'm going to have Eric introduce, introduce himself to us and get ready because I know there are going to be a lot of questions. I just have a handful of them. So just get those questions in and we're setting up watch parties too, guys, so you can be sure to join the watch parties. Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me on your show. So I, at this time, I guess I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Go ahead. I'm Eric Twiggs. I'm your procrastination prevention partner. I'm the <laughs> author of The Discipline of Now, and I'm the host of the 30 Minute Hour podcast. So I help entrepreneurs and executive leaders to ditch their excuses, to beat procrastination so they can make more money, get more done, and feel more confident. How did you discover that was a thing? <laughs> Now, it's, it's interesting. So this really, this whole journey of procrastination prevention and becoming more productive, it started back when I was in college. I went to Hampton University and one of my- Did really? All right. Go ahead. I didn't go there, but all right. I have friends who graduated. <laughs> we appreciate the support. <laughs> but no, so um, I was having a conversation with my good friend. I talk about this in the book. Uh, his name is Donnell, my fraternity brother, my line brother. I'm a member of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. And so we're having this conversation, and I, I have to admit, Stephanie, so we were a little different in those days, right? So, so like he was all about his purpose, and I was all about the party. And he was always getting on me like, man, you need to get serious. You need to get it together, figure out what you want to do. And I'm like, man, Donnell, later for all that, we have plenty of time to figure out what we want to do. You know, are you coming to the party with me or not? And so, you know, time went by. We hadn't talked for a while. And several weeks later, I got a phone call from his mother informing me of the fact that he was tragically killed in a car accident. Wow. I, I tell you, that really changed the way I thought about time and time management. And it really sent me the message that we don't have as much time as we think to leave the legacy that we want to leave. And that, and that was really the starting point. And it, it's just evolved over time into speaking and into the book and into ultimately my mission. So when you discovered that we don't have as much time as we think we do, and that is so true because time seems to speed up after that 21st birthday. And if you thought it sped up after 21, you know, once you get 30, it's just running a race. So you don't have as much time. So what was the first thing you did in order to get yourself on track? It was interesting. So initially, I was really focused on making as much money as possible, right? So my focus was, okay, I want to succeed in business. I'm just going to work. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to, we don't have as much time. I want to make money. But I got to this point where... I mean, and I had this, I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I, we won all these awards and my district, I got to a point, I was a district manager, you know, I had the nice car, you know, by the world standards, I was successful, but I, I'm, I literally, I remember I'm driving, I stopped at a stoplight, I looked in the rear view mirror and I could see the eyes, my eyes looking back at me and they were the eyes of someone that literally hated what he was doing. So I felt like I was successful but I wasn't really significant. And, and so from there, that's really when the journey began. Okay. That significance. And, it, and yeah, eventually I ended up joining Toastmasters International Speaking Group, um, National Speakers Association, and that's kind of how we got to this point. So what does it feel like when you feel like you're successful? but not significant. What, what were the emotions going through you? What thoughts came to mind? 
So it was interesting. Like there was this feeling of dread, like in the mornings uh -huh. when it was time to wake up. Like I would hit the snooze button, and like to this day, I, I have something I call a snooze button test. Okay. Uh -oh. like, if, you, if you find yourself hitting the snooze button repeatedly before you start your day, that's an indication that you're you're doing something that you don't look forward to. You know. But in, in those days, I would hit the snooze button, and I mean, I would have times where literally I'd wake up for like weeks at a time. Every morning I'd wake up at like 3.30. Just it couldn't get back to sleep because I was so just stressed out about what I had to face during the day. And I really didn't feel like this was in alignment with purpose. So, so those were the feelings that were going. And, and I can tell you like now I can wake up without an alarm clock. And I don't, I never dread doing what I have to do. It's, it's, it's a great feeling. So for those of you who are listening or watching, uh, dread, when you dread to get up, and it's the snooze button test. That's right. If you're doing that, then you know you're doing something that's not making your heart sing or making you feel important or fulfilled. So that's one thing. So, but some people hit the snooze button and just keep going back to sleep. So, but we need to find out how to figure out what it is you need to do. So how can you, other than the snooze button test, how can you tell if you are a procrastinator? Well, so procrastination is when you're delaying on those tasks that you know you need to do. You know, you can't, so sometimes we confuse prudence with procrastination, right? So just because, let's say you get an idea for a business, you know, just because you don't just immediately quit your regular job and go start this business, that doesn't necessarily mean you're procrastinating. That can mean you're doing your research. There's a time to be prudent. There's a time to do research. But when you're not moving, when you're not taking steps forward on the path and there's something you want to do and you know you're not taking the steps forward or there's a task that you need to do that you just aren't doing, that aren't getting done, mm -hmm. that's a sign that you're procrastinating. Okay. Next important thing is, so what are some of the important steps to take to end the cycle of procrastination? Because I think now people are pretty clear. So I'm delaying important tasks that I know I need to do tasks that are critical to, my, to me being successful. And if I'm delaying those, then that's procrastination. But what are some of the important steps to take to end the cycle of procrastination? Well, one, so one of the things is to really look, look for patterns. Okay. Right? You know, look for triggers. So is there something that triggers, triggers you to procrastinate? You know, look, look for pattern. Are there certain things that you're always procrastinating on? So it's one of those things. A lot of times you think that it's because you're being lazy, but like, there's usually there's, there's a root cause that that's there's something. And, and in most cases, in many cases, it's fear. Fear is like a leading cause of procrastination. You know, it manifests itself: fear of success. You have fear of failure. There's fear of the unknown. And like I've worked with entrepreneurs and executives who keep putting off, for example, you know, making a key hire, or they put off, you know, making a making a sales call. And a lot of times I'll ask them, okay, so what are you afraid of? And it usually turns out that's usually it. It's like, okay, what if I can't afford this person? What if this? What if that? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? So fear fear is a, a key thing that can cause you to procrastinate. You start feeling that anxiety and then you're looking for relief. And you go to Facebook, you go to you know, your, your text messages, you're looking for that break from that feeling of anxiety that you feel. So look, you know, pay attention to those triggers and recognize that it's fear is usually at the root. Now, what if you really know you need to make those sales calls, but you just hate making sales calls? Okay, you just dread sales calls. <laughs> you up three thirty in the morning, dread that sales call is not scheduled till ten o'clock. So, how do you overcome that? So, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. The key <laughs> is you have to focus more on the process than you do the outcome, right? You you can't focus on the the reason you you may dread the sales call is well, what if I get rejected? What if they don't buy? What if, again, instead of that, focus on, just do the math because the numbers don't lie. So you know if it takes you 10 calls to get 
two sales and, and you need to get your go, your quota is to have these two sales, let's say, and it takes you 10 calls, you have to f focus on the process of making the 10 calls. So at the end of the day, did I make my 10 calls or not? Right? So you can't, don't worry about the outcome. Don't worry about how it goes. Worry about making those calls. And what you'll find is that now, instead of it taking 10 calls, you need to get two sales. It may, if, as you continue to focus on the process, it may take you seven calls, six calls, eight calls maybe. So that's, that's really the key, is really focus on what is the process and focus on that. And the outcome will take care of itself. Okay, so there's no magic in the actual call itself other than what your numbers say if it takes you 10 calls to make two sales then you make the 10 calls to two sales and don't get caught up in the call just look at the process so you've got a plan and then your your goal should be whatever it takes for you to reach those sales and then you just sort of did i do it yes 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 and that's where you get your success from. absolutely it's really it's about taking that action i mean that, that that's really the key you're, you're planting the seeds. Like, it's, like, it's like if you go out and plant seeds in your backyard, you're not like, oh, when is it going to grow? Oh, my God. Oh, you're focused on planting the seed, <laughs> putting it in the right soil, giving it water, making sure it gets sunlight. You've done your thing, right? Okay. You, you've got to count on the supernatural to, to do its part, you know, to, to, to make it grow. And, and it's the same thing with the things we want to accomplish. Okay, so... What are some of the pitfalls of procrastination? So, so here's the thing, right? So it, it's a silent killer. You, you don't really realize it's impacting you because a lot of times there's no immediate negative consequence. Let's say you, you put, you're putting off preparing for your presentation. There, there's no buzzer that goes off. There's no alarm. It's not like the procrastination police come and arrest you or anything like that. You know, so, so you think, you, you think you're getting away with it. And, and then here's what compounds the problem. You do the presentation. Let's say you wait till the last minute. You do the presentation. And then people tell you, oh, wow, Eric, that's a great, a great job. That was a great presentation. So now you start to tell yourself, I work better under pressure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the next thing I said, there's some people who really swear they work better under pressure. You know, you know what I call that? Yeah, I call that justification for procrastination. <laughs> That's what that is. But here's the thing. I talk about this in the book. It's proven. If you, especially if you're doing something that's creative, the quality goes down if you wait to the last minute. Because if you, one of the best things you can do, if you've got a, create, if you've got a presentation, like it's, I don't care if it's three months out, start immediately. I mean, and starting could be just starting to do research. Right. Just starting could be just reading the book on the topic, starting the interview. Just take one small step in that direction. And, and what happens is you start to get ideas coming to you over that time. And, and then when you get to the point of your, your presentation is going to be much better, your ideas have now had an opportunity to incubate, as opposed to now think about it. If you just wait to the last minute, you're focused on the clock. <laughs> you're you're yeah. focused on getting yeah. this thing done. Because you're under pressure now. So it's, you know, people tell themselves that, but it, it's a silent killer. Your work's not going to be as good if you wait to the last minute. Okay. Uh, because I hear that a lot. I work, you know, oh, I work really well under pressure. I work well under pressure if I have to work well under pressure, but I do really enjoy having some time to prepare. Because as you said, it becomes fun and you learn more and you can relax with it. So, now, I do have something. Let me say something. So I think it does help to have deadlines. I think I think deadlines. So what 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 I recommend to people is give yourself like an artificial deadline. So before it, it doesn't have to be you know when it's due, but it, you can give yourself artificial deadlines, and, and that can help you to you know put put yourself under pressure to get it done during that time window. But make sure your deadline is well before the real one. And he did say deadline, so it's it's when you open up your calendar, there's dates there for a reason, right? <laughs> so it's set one. So I like the idea of uh, giving yourself artificial deadlines, but then that gives you some time to put it aside and think about it and make any more changes that you 
that come to you now that you're familiar with the subject and you don't have that pressure. Right. What about some of the, uh, the real serious effects of, of procrastination? Well, you, you just, you, you can damage your brand, right? And because we like, for example, like we all know that person, like whatever organization, wow. you, it's always that one person who, it, they're just known for being late, right? If the meeting starts at nine o'clock, they'll be there at 10 after coming in to shovel. You know, it, it, there's that one person, and even on, and I've seen this in a lot of corporate job situations, but now they're branded as the person that's always late. And when it comes time for promotions, if, if you're in a corporate sector, you don't know that your name may be, your name may come up. And, and you just never know, you could just miss out on an opportunity because they feel like, hey, you know, we can't count on this person to be on time. Uh, so you, you, you really, you damage your brand. And then some people, they take, they perceive, if, you, if you're late with deadlines, if you're late just to meetings, that you don't respect their time. So you, you can really damage relationships. And a lot of things we want to accomplish in life have everything to do with having the right relationship with people. So it's really, like I said, there's a lot to it. Yeah, there's... um. Uh, one of the uh, CEOs, Carla Harris, it talks about being t you have two types of currency in corporate America. One is performance and one is relationships. And it's generally the relationship currency that uh, makes sure that you're promoted and you do well. And you're right. If you're known as the person who late all the time, no one wants to give you any challenging assignment. So how does, so when people are late all the time, that becomes a habit. So how do they break that habit? How do you, how do you train them to go from being the person that's always five or 10 minutes late, one says, oh, they waited to start, now you can start the party, to, <laughs> to one that's, <laughs> the one that's on time. How do you change that behavior? So, so I always say, anytime you're looking to replace, if you, if you have a bad habit, the, the way to break the cycle is to replace it with a better habit, right? Okay. And so, the better habit in this situation is something that's called the 50% buffer. So do you give yourself a 50% buffer? So let's say if, uh, if, if, if normally it takes you an hour to get to a particular destination, so the 50%, you, you pretend like it's going to take you an additional 30 minutes. So you give yourself an hour and a half. And you, you, you pretend like it's going to take you an hour and a half. You, you know, you leave at the same time, so you, you pretend to even, so that, that 50% buffer is a good habit to get into. And if you do that, just that one thing, you know, you're, you're almost never going to be late. And so here's the thing, right? We are really bad at predicting how long things are going to take. Like that's the number one, they call that like the time fallacy, the time management fallacy. We're bad at predicting how long things will take. And we don't, we never factor in worst case scenarios. I mean, like a little thing for me, like anytime I have, if I have a Zoom meeting, I never log on to the Zoom meeting right on time. Like, like if, you, if you say, okay, we're gonna meet at 6.45 in this Zoom meeting, I'm always logging on at like 6.40. Because I know the one time I try to get on at 6.40, that's the time my computer's not gonna, up, my computer will be having issues, it's still gonna be doing some type of update, so we have to account for that. And I think so if you do the buffer, I mean, that, that's a good way to account for things that could go wrong. Yeah, I actually <laughs> logged on to Zoom 45 minutes before to make sure there were no updates that needed to run. You're so right. <laughs> exactly. And then I said, okay, now I can log off and no one knows just how anal I am so I can go on time. Like, <laughs> hey, we're here. <laughs> So oh, <laughs> the time fallacy. So I like that. I like the planning backwards. I remember um, I once, uh, Bill Gates was running, they were running the project and when he was active at Microsoft and they told him, oh, we can have this project done by this date. And he said, oh, okay. So he planned backwards. So that means you're going to have, it takes 30 days to do this. So by this date, you're going to have that. And by this date, you're going to have that. And everybody said, no, we, we can't. So they actually had to step into the project to see how long something takes. And it's all right to add some extra time. Because you're right, we never know when there's an accident or the traffic signal is going to not work or, or 
you can't find parking or just going to the meeting. You think it's three minutes down the hall and then all of a sudden you didn't, you don't have everything or you have to go to the bathroom and, and then you're late. So that's a good, that is great. So we've got the 50% buffer for time because we know now that psychologically we are very bad at predicting how long something takes. So that's pretty good. So what, so as a procrastinator pre prevention partner, what is, what roles do you play? Uh, say, are they, and are they different between entrepreneurs or solo entrepreneurs or, or large co corporations? So, I mean, I, I serve in that capacity in different ways. So it could be doing a keynote presentation where, I mean, like what, on Monday, I just did a keynote for this Passionpreneur Summit. Um, it's over a thousand, a thousand people that have logged on to this virtual summit. So I, so I do keynote presentation. I'll do workshops for, you know, it could be eight to 12 people in a workshop. And we, and that way, everybody, that, that, I really get jazzed by that because we can really talk and interact back and forth. Wow things that cause us to procrastinate. Um, I, you know, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I'll coach the, uh, the entrepreneur. The, the challenge with the entrepreneur is that he or she, they, they don't have a supervisor. So they, they're on the, they kept in some ways they're left to their own devices. So it's easy for them to get off track with certain things. And, and also, you know, I'll, I'll work with executives uh, as well with one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and, and one of the things I just provide accountability that that's one of the biggest things in my big role, as far as being a procrastination prevention partner, just having that person to be accountable to can make a big difference. And as an accountability partner, um, what's the relationship like? Do you just, you give them ideas or, um, you sort of nudge them to stay on track? How do because uh, generally it would be much different from an entrepreneur because entrepreneurs really do think that they make, they do make all of the decisions because they don't have a supervisor and they generally don't have uh, other executives underneath them. So what would that look like to an entrepreneur, to someone who owns their own company? So one of the, the first things we do is we get clear. And I talk about this in the book. Clarity is the starting point of success. So we really get clear on what it is that they really want. And so I, I like to, you know, from time windows, we start with five years, right? So if I could, because I, I think we underestimate what we can accomplish in five years, but we overestimate what we can accomplish in five months. So I, we, I, I start with five years, okay? So let's fast forward, let's get in our time machine. It's now August of 2025. You're like, man, this is, this is the best five years I've had in business. You know, what, what are those specific things that need to be in place for you to feel that way. So then we get clear on that. Uh, and then we get from there, we start working, you know, looking at the next quarter. What are the next 12? What do we need to accomplish in the 12 weeks that align with the five year plan? And so now that we're clear, it, it's, it's just about me, you know, just keeping the mirror in front of the person and, and saying, okay, you, this is what you, this is what you said you wanted. So what did you do? What have you done since we've spoken last? That's in alignment with what you said you wanted. So once the person's clear, that, that's really a key starting point. And have you ever had one that says, I've done nothing <laughs> because I hit the snooze button too many times? <laughs> I mean, I can tell you some stories. I mean, <laughs> they duck, I had my phone calls ducked. I mean, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Okay. So, go ahead. How do you get them back on track? You know, again, I, th I think you, you you just have to remind them of of the goal. And, and I, I've I've said to people, so I'm like, you know what? Sometimes I feel like I want this more than you do. What, is is this? I mean, I've, I've said to people, look, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop talking to you about this because obviously I'm just being a nag. This isn't really what you want. I'm, I'm just gonna let it go. I, we'll just let it go. We'll talk about something. Let's talk about the Redskins. Let, let's let's talk about baseball because this isn't. So, so sometimes that can tend to get the person. I mean, and they get, but you have people on the opposite side of the spectrum that literally, I mean, if we say we're going to do A, B, and C, they're going to do A, B, and C. So it, it's it, it's across the board. Duck and phone calls. <laughs> okay. I think that's hilarious. So to people who are 
a lot of people are working their goals and their dreams while they're working a full-time job uh, because they're preparing to bridge into something they love. They're being prudent, they're building their business. They're preparing to bridge into something they love once they leave the full-time job so they can get that, that, path, that dream and that passion up uh, as a toddler prior to leaving. Um, when they procrastinate, I know that that really sets them behind. And has, when you work with those people, what are some of the things you do to keep them motivated? Because they're working with probably lack of energy. They're really not getting any sleep. And they're trying to find somebody else to do the things that's on their to-do list. So how do you keep those people on track? Well, yeah, I think you have to look at, you know, you know prioritizing. And I, I always say, and, and I wish someone had told me what I'm about to say, you know, at, at, earlier in my career that, you know, just because something has to be done, it doesn't mean that you have to do it, right? So, so you really, especially if you're working a full-time job and trying to build a business, you, re- you have to be very intentional. So it, it, with some people, it helps if they get a, a virtual assistant someone to handle some of the, the administrative tasks. Because a lot of times, if you're trying to work a full-time job, you're trying to do the administrative tasks, you're trying to do all these different things. So it helps if you can get some of, that, some of those things off of your plate, um, that can help. So that, that's something I look at. You know, what, what is that person doing that they really need to hand off so they can free them up to work on their passion? Probably some of those sales calls nobody wants to make. <laughs> <laughs> so now the challenge with the sales call, <laughs> most entrepreneurs, the entrepreneur is the one that should be doing that because nobody can really sell your business like you. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so that, that's a challenge. So, so for those people, they really should write a list, as you were saying, of all of the steps that need to be done and literally ask themselves a hard question. Does it make a difference if I do this or someone else? Because the entrepreneur does need to sell their business, but they may not need to update all the Excel spreadsheets or or all of that kind of stuff. Uh, that's something some else. So what about that entrepreneur, the one that's trying to get started, that just must do everything? How do you break that habit? Well, I, I, got, I think it's about awareness. So the whole goal is to stay in what's called your zone of genius, right? And there, there's something that's called like the 5% rule. So entrepreneurs, you, you have like, there's 5% of things that you and you alone should really be doing because it's you, you're, you're the face of your business. It's in your area of expertise. It's, it's your thing that you were put on this earth to do. So in a, in a perfect world, you should be spending most, all of your time doing that, those 5% tasks and then everything else you know, can you delegate it? You know, is there someone else in your organization that should be you know, making the parts run or, or doing some of these other things that really are outside? And so, but the, so the, the way you get them in that habit, if you have them write the things down, so just, just writing down, you, you make, make your job description. You know, right, first of all, write out everything you do and then go back and look at it and say, okay, well, of everything I'm doing, you know, what, what falls into that 5% that only I can do? And then everything else, ultimately over time, try to, you know, find someone to delegate it, you know, get your virtual, get your virtual assistant, whatever you need to do. And then the hard part, which is usually what people ask me a lot, is what if they're at a point where they can't afford a virtual assistant? How do they determine what they should be doing? Because sometimes people get tied up in those small tasks and they don't do the things that are going to bring the money in in the door so how do they determine what they need to do how do they prioritize the task so well first off i mean i wouldn't just say you know i would before you say you can't afford it it's a lot there's a lot of ways to accomplish it you know, okay to make it very affordable so make sure for certain um that it's that it, it isn't affordable if you're saying you just can't do it but the other thing the best priori- pr- prioritizing system i can tell you i call it it's called the twigs top five right okay so we've already talked about you know what your five-year plan is right so now you know what you want to do accomplish in the next 90 days it ties to your five-year plan so now every day you're writing down your five biggest priorities that are going to move you towards what you want 
So the way this works is at the end of the day, so let's say now is the end of the day, I'm looking at tomorrow and I'm saying, what are my five most important tasks that I have to get done? What are those five things? And my goal is to win. I, I want to win every day. So when, when I knock off all the five tasks, I, I won for that particular day. And you, it really builds momentum. And, and it, it's a confidence builder. Because when, when you get to the point where you're consistently doing the things you said you would do, it, it really builds confidence. And, and you, you'll find yourself, if you do this a lot, you'll be surprised at how much you get done and how productive you can become. And know, and know that, okay, if I can't afford a virtual assistant right now, you know, at, at some point I will. So still, I will be able to. So still make, make plans and be always thinking about how you can, you know, get some of the, these tasks off your plate. You know, I think the magic in that process too is even if you don't do the five things every single day, if that's the goal, you will find yourself doing the most of the time yes. and you would have accomplished a lot more over 90 days than you would have if you didn't have the list in front of you. And here's something else you just brought up. So the key there too is to not beat yourself up. So if you're, let's say when you first start this and you accomplish only two of the five, don't say, oh, uh, you know, I'm such a failure. Uh, see, I always procrastinate. Don't judge yourself. Just keep going. Keep going. That, that's the key. You, it, it, you have to get out of the habit of uh, putting judgment on yourself. That, that's so important. And that's where people get me. Almost, you have to factor failure into your success plan. You have to understand that you're going to come up short. There, there are times I don't accomplish all five every day. So we, we just have to just know that you're going to fail sometimes, but be willing to get back up. Okay, so plan for failure. That's one thing I don't think that we do. Cool. So is procrastination a form of laziness? You know, a lot of times growing up, you hear, especially from your parents, oh, you're just procrastinating. You're just lazy. <laughs> so is it really a form of laziness? Well, it, it, cause it's interesting. So some people, they can procrastinate. And a lot of times it's context-based because you can procrastinate in one area of your life, but then let's say you can go to work and never procrastinate on anything ever. So it's not necessarily a character trait. I think it depends on what specifically it is that you're procrastinating on. And sometimes it's just not that deep. Sometimes I just don't like doing the task. I, I just, I, I don't get any joy out of it. It has to be done. I'm only doing it because something bad will happen if I don't do it, but <laughs> I just don't like to task, you know, so it doesn't mean I I'm necessarily lazy as a person. I just don't like to task. And so that, that's where you just have to figure out, is it something that you can delegate to someone else or is it something that you can combine with a task you do like? Like, for example, for me, if it's something where I, I have to update a spreadsheet or something like that. Uh, that's when I'm listening to audiobooks or I'm listening to inspirational music. So that makes it a little easier. But it, it may not be that you're lazy in every facet of your life. It, it's just that it could be you just don't like doing that task. So, Mom, we just didn't like washing those dishes, okay? Hey. <laughs> we got a and we just didn't like washing the dishes. Perfect like, example. <laughs> we did it because we knew something bad was going to happen. <laughs> It was a consequence for that one. The consequence to it. That's how it was in my house. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would have the, we, we would have the pan and we, and we would, my brother and I, we would take water and put it in it. Say, Ma, oh, we're just letting that one soak. <laughs> you know, we, we would get to that later. We had to let that one soak. <laughs> right. For some reason, my mom never bought it and made us go back and wash it again. I know. <laughs> it never works. So, but it's good to know that it's okay. Uh, because there are some tasks you're just not going to like doing. I don't like to file. Just don't like to do it. It's necessary. I get it done. But generally, it's not going to be the first thing on the list. Uh, I usually have to set aside special time and promise myself a treat to get that done. But you do, you're right. There's some things that some people thrive off of making the sales calls or working with marketing or, or uh, just working on the project. That, I mean, they just light up. They love that. They're very good at that. But they still got to file the files at the end of the day. And so just know that 
It doesn't mean that you're lazy. It just means you're just not feeling that particular task. But if that task that you're not feeling is one of the things that you need to do in order to meet your five-year plan, then we got a problem, right? They need exactly. to do a fast procrastination reset. Cool. Yeah. So when people are looking for strategies for reaching their goals, um, and in this case, they know that they're not very good at staying on track and or staying on schedule or even getting started. Some people just can't get started. Once they get started, man, they're out the door. You can't catch them. Um, what are some tips for people like that? And then you got to share some stories with us. <laughs> so so that my audience don't feel like they're the only people that Stephanie is fussing at. <laughs> well, so one of the things is yeah, this thing of perfectionism. So one of the big things that holds people back is they feel like, well, you know, I can't start. You know, I, okay. I, have, all, I have to have all the answers. I have to have everything figured out. You know, I, I'm doing research. I, I hear that all the time. So I talk to somebody and they say, Eric, guess what? You know, I'm, I'm going to write a book. And I'm like, oh, that's great news. Okay, you're going to write your book. And then uh, six, seven months down the road, hey, how's your book coming? Oh, I'm still doing research. You know, I talked about that. Oh, I'm still doing research. At, at some point, so the key is, and, and I, I say this to people, this is so important, that you can't allow perfect to become the enemy of progress. So don't, don't focus on being perfect. And so there's uh, there's something that uh, that Colin Powell came up with. The general Colin Powell, he talks. Mm -hmm. He calls it like the forty seventy rule. That you know a, a great leader, he says, can move forward with a minimum of forty percent of the information and a maximum of seventy percent. So once you get past that forty percent point, you know you you can move. You don't have to have everything figured out. And, and and the other thing is when you're moving towards your goal, small steps count. Small steps. So for example, you know, you say, hey, you know what? I, I want to get healthy. That, that, you know, that doesn't mean you go out and run a marathon, right? <laughs> that means, you know, you can start by walking around the block. And then the walk may turn into a jog. And before you know it, you're running five miles a day. But, but it starts. So, so that's, if, if you're looking to accomplish your goal, the key is really just focusing on what the next step. And it could be a small step and, and just really just building from there. So small steps count. Absolutely. I love that. Cool. So now you're going to have to share some of the stories. Give us a success story, a couple of success stories. So I, mean, I had someone that I was working with and, you know, they were, we, we would talk and it was always negative. Every day, oh yeah, I got this going this employee. Oh, you know, I got got this going on with this customer. You know, it's always mad. Finally, I went one one of our calls. I just cut him off and missed him. Just stop, stop, stop. I, I got a homework assignment for you. So before we start our calls, you have to tell me at least one thing that you're grateful for. Oh, okay. He's kind of like, eh, yeah, okay, okay, I get it. I'll do that. And so at first, he kind of stumbled through it. But I mean, uh, as we went on, four things, five things, to the, and, and I, this literally transformed his business. I mean, he, I mean, he got to the point where he didn't have to be there anymore, and it still, it was starting to make money, and it, it, it was, it was sustained, uh, and, it, and it also would get to a point where, if it, he would, he would say, "Hey, Eric, we didn't talk about what I'm grateful for today." You know, if I, if, if I started talking to him about, and then we didn't talk about his gratitude, he would remind me. And, and it's, so that, that's like, that's one of the things I talk about in, in the book. Like one of the foundations of overcoming procrastination is your mindset and your attitude. And if you're focused on the things that you're grateful for and the positivity. And so the other thing is focusing on your wins, right? So think about, you know, make a, make a win list. So as you're going throughout your day, what, what are the good things that happen? You know, you gotta, you gotta, positive Google review, you got that sale, you got, you, you were on this excellent podcast with Stephanie, you know, that, you got to focus on, <laughs> you got to focus on the wins and the, and the things that, that are going well, uh, and it really helps your, your mindset, but no, but that, that's a story that comes to mind when I think about, you know, success stories. 
school. What about one? It wasn't quite so successful. Well, I got I have plenty of those. So I, I, I could talk about myself, right? So I, I'm the I'm the procrastination guy. But it took me like three years to get started once I realized that, you know, and you know what, I really should be in the public speaking space, right? Because, you know, I, I would say all these negative things to myself. You know, I got to the point where I, I figured, okay, you know, I, want, I really want to be a professional speaker. But then I would say, well, what can I say that hasn't been said already? Why would somebody pay me to come into their organization? Well, what am I going to, what's my topic? So I had all these negative, so it took me three years to move. Because I, again, but, but here's the thing. Once I just started taking, I, I focused, okay, you know what? I know I'm passionate about public speaking. I'm just going to get actively involved with Toastmasters. And then when I did that, the next step started revealing itself and then step by step. So. Okay, I'm taking great notes. <laughs> I see. Oh, I, am. I like to try to recap it so later on. So I want to be sure I didn't miss anything. So people are listening and they are um, sending questions. And one of the questions is, how much does the crowd you hang with affect your ability to move forward? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that is, that is a huge part of it. Um, I talk about it in the book. You have to be aware of the people that you hang around, right? So MIT, the school that they did a study and they said that the typical person's income is the combined average of the three people that they spend the most time with. So, you know, I'm actively going to try to meet Oprah and Jay-Z and Will Smith, <laughs> but, but no, the, uh, but no, it, it's everything. And because they re their habits will rub off. And, and I always say that behavior is contagious. And so I, so I think that's a great question. It's very important that you look at the people that you're surrounding yourself with, because at the bottom line, if you spend enough time around three chronic procrastinators, you'll eventually end up being the fourth. Yes, and I found that it is easier for people's negative behavior and habits to rub off on you than it is for your positive energy and habits to rub off on them. Oh, that, that's very true. Yeah. Absolutely. So the answer is yes, watch the people you hang around. Your mothers, our mothers told us that too. So uh, it's still true today. Yes. And make sure, as I, as we all know, MIT did do the study. So the three people you spend the most time with, you will make the average of their incomes. So if you want more money or you want more stuff, you've got to hang around with different people. Uh, there's a quote I like that. If you're the biggest fish in the pond, you're in the wrong pond. 100% so, true. Okay. Uh, another question is, how addictive is procrastination? it can become very addictive because again, if you think you're benefiting from it, there, there's a payoff. So, so what happens is what, one of the things with procrastination is you, you get to hide behind it and you know, you, you get to say, you always give yourself an out because you can say, let, let's say you procrastinate on something and it goes well, you can say, man, I, I'm a genius. I procrastinated and, and still I, I did great, but let's say, if it doesn't go well, you can say, well, yeah, if I just started on, if I just started earlier, but, but you really never test your limits. You never really, you're never really putting yourself on the line and putting yourself out there. So that can be addictive, you know, being able to hide behind this whole procrastination thing is something else to watch out for. Do you find that a lot of people who procrastinate really talk a good game? They really have facts and figures and, and you end up talking to them feeling incredibly impressed about what they know. <laughs> or is that just me? <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and some people, they, they come up with great ideas, but they, they may struggle with the implementation of their ideas. So that, that could be their gift. They, they, you know, they can come up with these strategies, they come up with these ideas, but when it comes down to, 
uh, like there, there's a book, it's called um, it's Traction is the name of the book. And it talks about like the visionary, you have a visionary person who starts an organization, they're usually the big idea person. A lot of times they struggle with the details. So they need that person that's an integrator. You know, that person who's mm -hmm. operations manager, who really gets the day-to-day -day nets and bolts things done. And so if you're a solopreneur and you're the big idea person, again, your integrator could be that virtual assistant that handles a lot of those little details. Because some people just struggle with the details. Like they, they, they come up with the idea and expect you to figure out how to get it done. <laughs> you know? But no, so, so I, I do see that, that that happens sometimes. I've got another question. It sounds like dealing with procrastination is more mental. How physical is it? How physical? I, I think a lot of it is mental. Okay. A, a big part of it, especially if, if when you start dealing with fears. Um, I, I think if you are intentional, like if you have an exercise routine, for example, that's a physical way to mentally overcome procrastination. You know, there, there are all these studies, it's very interesting, like there are all these studies about how, like your, how you feel in your body can impact your, your emotions and your thoughts and everything else. Um, so that's why if you look at a, a lot of high performers, they have a habit of exercising. They, they get, you know, at least three days a week, they're, they're intentional about getting cardio. Because so that from a physical standpoint, you know, when you've got energy, when you feel better, you're less likely to procrastinate. And if you don't, if, if you're just tired, you're worn out. So that from sort of that's the physical aspect of it. You know, Dr. Ron Friedman uh, published a paper about ex exercising, and I had only thought about exercises as just man, making sure your body temple is healthy, because you can't do all this other stuff if, if you're not feeling well or healthy. He also pointed out, which I thought was really interesting, and so for those of you who don't exercise, you may consider this, is that it's actually more for the brain than it is for the body. The body does benefit from it, but it's the brain that is the, the major benefactor of your physical exercise because it creates new, um, new, new pathways and it burns off some of that, um, I guess, excess noise about what you can and cannot do. So I thought, oh, cool. So there's, there are a lot of benefits to exercise. Absolutely. So do you recommend exercise to your clients? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in every, if I do a keynote or workshop and it's about procrastination, I always talk about exercise. I mean, like there's, there's a, this guy, Thomas Corley, he did a study like of all of these wealthy entrepreneurs. Oh, and yeah, he sure did. <laughs> you heard about Rich Habits? He's got Rich that. Habits, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> So you, so you know, so he says that what, 76% of the wealthy, they have this habit of getting that great regular cardio for, uh, three times a week, you know, 30 minutes a day at a minimum. Yes, he did. And some of those things surprised me. Um, the exercise, uh, the amount of reading, you know, a, a lot of habits that had nothing to do or didn't appear to correlate to their successes was all the things that correlated to their successes. So I said, oh, gosh. And then you find out that the majority of the millionaires and billionaires are self-made anyway. It's like, what are we missing? We can get that book and just start checking off stuff. And we would open the way. Cool. So you're, are your clients really happy when you talk to them about exercise? Well, I, I think it's one of those things that they, they know they need to do. Um, you know, I have some that they, they have some that they, they – exercise here and there, um, but it's, it's something they, they know that it, it's critical for health. And especially in this, in this current time, I think I get less resistance about exercise. I think everybody understands kind of the need for you know, to build up your immune system. And one of the good things, like you know, as I, I, I go through the neighborhood, I see more people out walking than ever. You know, that people, people out walking, they're out jogging, um, and I think that that's a, a positive that's come out of this whole pandemic situation. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's an easier sell now than in years past. <laughs> I, 
see more people walking too. I walk the neighborhood, but I decided that they much rather walk than clean their house because that's all you got to do. Am I cleaning up again today? I can, you know? gotta mix that up, right? So, yeah, it is an easier sell today, but it. I think that with that, people are giving healthier and people are doing more because they feel a lot better. And as you said, it, it just burns off lots of stress and, and just negative feelings. It actually, it produces those endorphins that make you feel happy. Absolutely. Cool. So tell us more about your book. Okay. So my book, is, it's called The Discipline of Now, 12 Practical Principles to Overcome Procrastination. And, and it's divided up into three main sections. We talk about the cost of procrastination. We talk about the causes of procrastination. And then we get into the cure. And what makes my book different from the other books on the topic of procrastination, time management, productivity, is I've come up with the procrastination prevention pyramid. So it, it's a, a model, uh, and, and, it's the whole, and, and if you follow the model that's in the book, and it's got five levels to it. Uh, if you follow that, you'll find that you've overcome procrastination, or at least you're procrastinating a whole lot less uh, if, you, if you follow that model. And it, it's a quick, it's an easy read, simple read, it's 100 pages, right? So I figure if you have an issue with procrastination, you don't want to read a 500-page book. So <laughs> well, Stephen King doesn't have any procrastinators reading his books. Apparently not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and where can they find your book? So they can get it uh, on my website. It's thedisciplineofnow.com. Matter of fact, I just happen to have a copy. Perfect. Right. Show your book. That's right. The Discipline of Now. Here's what it looks like. The Discipline of Now. Go to the website, thedisciplineofnow.com. You can pick up a copy. It's on, it's on audio. Uh, you can get it as a paperback. Uh, you can also get at get it um, as an ebook as well. Oh, audio, okay. Um, also, let me let us know how we how people who are listening want to reach out to you can contact you. So we know you where you can buy the book, and I want you guys to be sure that you get this book because we all have some issues with procrastination. How do they contact you directly? So you can. Uh, you can visit my web, the Eric, uh, Eric at ericmtwigs.com. Um, I'm sorry, that's my email address, Eric at ericmtwigs.com. If you need to contact me, you can email me. Um, by the way, um, I do have a special offer uh, for your uh, viewers and, and listeners. Uh, it, I have a text message offer. You text the number 474747 and type in the word twigs, you'll get a bonus audio. It's one of my podcast episodes where we talk about the urgency of now and we provide some additional tips to become more productive and overcome procrastination. You text that number 474747, type in twigs, and it'll instantly come to your phone. Okay, so the name of the book is The Discipline of Now. Hold your book up again. And it has the website is the same name, the discipline of now.com is available in audio, Kindle, or ebook, as well as the actual book itself. And I think that audio thing is really cool. I've got to do that. So, so everyone's wanting to listen to the book. I enjoy the feel and sound of the word, but it's like I gotta do the audio. And text to 474747 Twigs, T-W-I-G-G-S. So Tango Whiskey. Uh oh, Mr. I. <laughs> golf, golf, Sierra. <laughs> so, so that way everyone knows. Uh, and then that way you can get the bonus audio. So, we're coming to the last few minutes. So, if there are any more questions, let me check to see. Um, um, I'm a chronic procrastinator. Uh, I've tried everything and nothing's worked. What should I do now to try to end my procrastination habits? Hmm. Well, again, so the, the person, are they saying they procrastinate with everything and every aspect of their life? Or so the, the, what I would say is I would look, look, 
look very careful because I'd be willing to bet there are certain patterns. You think it's, you, it's everything, but it's probably not every single, I have yet to meet someone that procrastinates in every single area of their life. Usually it's context-based. It's usually, it, it, it could be that, again, you don't like the task. Um, it, it could also be that you really haven't found your passion and identified your purpose. So if you feel like, you know, you're procrastinating on everything, you know, at, what is my purpose? Ask yourself that question. You know, what, what was I put on this earth to do? And if you have no idea what that answer is, start the process of, of really discovering what it is, you know, what, what is your purpose? And I mean, the, I've got some, some tools and things that in the book, because once you, when you when you become aligned with purpose and you can line up your actions to the, the North Star, as they say, I mean, you, you'll find that you procrastinate a, a whole lot less. So to the, to, the, to the person who actually texts and to those listening, you don't procrastinate all the time. I'm sure because you asked the question, you didn't hold back on that. So that's one example that shows you didn't, you don't procrastinate all the time. Exactly. But look for the pattern. So carry a little notebook with you, as you know, I always say. And when you find yourself procrastinating, just write down what you're doing, what it is you, you're procrastinating about. Because it could simply be one or two things. But as Eric reminded us, we're just not very good at deciding. <laughs> how much we procrastinate or when we procrastinate or when something's good. We're just not very good at estimating that. So this way you can find out what those things are and start to work to eliminate those things. And sometimes we just can be doing stuff we just have no business doing because we don't like it. Yeah. So, and here's something else too. When, like if you, and this is kind of like if you, if you're really not clear on your purpose, you find yourself saying yes to a lot of things. So someone, uh, says, someone says, Oh, hey, we need you to share this committee. Yes. Hey, we need you to be a part of this. We want you to be the president of this organization. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But when you're clear on your purpose and, and what you really want to accomplish, you can line that up. And, and then you can start to make a no list in advance. You know, hey, this, if this doesn't line up. You know, if this doesn't make me money, if, it, if it's not making me happy, it's not, you know, so you can really line, line your decisions up. But again, it goes back to really knowing what your purpose is. So I would give that back to that person who asked that question. That's something I would check for. Uh, how clear are you on, on your ultimate purpose? <coughs> so we're down to the last couple minutes. I want to thank you very much for joining me. I have really enjoyed this conversation and I've got my own to-do list. <laughs> and it's like, I, uh, this is really good. So again, be got, guys who are watching and listening, be sure you reach out to Eric. His book is available uh, on the discipline of now.com in various uh, formats. Also, don't forget that text 474747 twigs and that's tango, whiskey, India, golf, golf, Sierra. I got it. Okay. For the bonus audio. I need to start uh, doing that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Make it easy for everybody. Makes it easy for everybody. So I want you, as we come to the end of the show, to remember to do not go gently into that good night. I want you to find a heel that is worth dying for, and I want you to take it. I want you to be the person that you are waiting for and to make today so awesome that yesterday gets jealous. I want you to, above all, do it your way and be inspired and to further notice. I'm Stephanie wilson Coleman, the Empowerment Doctor, and this has been the Zoom podcast of A Sip of Inspiration with Eric Twiggs. Thank you very much, Eric, and we're going to say good night and sign off. Good night. Good night. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me. <laughs>